the AI hoax is not really what I'm going to be speaking about. What I want to explain today is that even if it's a complete mistake to expect biological intelligence to be replicable in silicon-based machines, the opposite could still seem inevitable to people. For a complicated set of reasons to do with founding philosophical assumptions of science and technology and the history of industrialization, AI could look inevitable even though it's impossible. Right. So, to begin, to get everything clear, what are we actually talking about today? The term AI is used to refer to many different kinds of technology, both actual ones and science fictional ones. My focus is on the kind of AI that aspires to replicate the all-round intelligence of human beings, or more modestly, of animals whose cognitive skills we're quite familiar with, like a dog or a cat. This is what's normally known as artificial general intelligence, or AGI. What do we mean by artificial? The double meaning of this word was something that was noticed by one of the founders of AI research, the American cognitive scientist and economist, Herbert Simon. So I'll give you some of his words on a slide. So as he writes here, he looked at his dictionary and saw that it defines artificial as produced by art rather than by nature, not genuine or natural, I should say, affected, not pertaining to the essence of the matter. Um, and you can see there that there are these synonyms, affected, factitious, manufactured, sham, spurious, trumped up. And then what would be the opposite of artificial is actual, genuine, honest, real, truthful. So he's saying that with this double meaning of artificial, you see that there's this ambivalent feeling that people have towards their own products. But what he wants it to mean by artificial in the term AI is just this neutral thing, that it's man-made as opposed to natural. But to lay my cards on the table, I think that the negative meaning that Herbert Simon dislikes gives you the right way to think about the artificial in current AI. And this is based on deep learning in artificial neural networks. So I've put on the slides here just a schematic of one of these um, deep learning architectures that you might have heard about, which would be behind, say, face recognition technology or object recognition. And some like famous examples of this that have been in the news would be technologies like GPT-3, the language processing AI, or AlphaGo, the one that um, DeepMind uh, produced a few years ago and beat the world grandmaster at the game of Go. So it's a kind of, it's often talked about as like a simulation of a brain network, because you see all of these little nodes here. They're very schematic, idealized um, computer models of what people maybe 60 years ago thought was going on in actual neurons in your brain. But all neuroscientists know that the brain itself operates in a way which is quite different from what's simulated in a model like this. So there is this um, kind of, yeah, there's this kind of ambivalence within the community of thinking of these as, in some sense, artificial brains, but in other ways, recognizing that they're really not brain-like at all. And neuroscientists themselves are interested in the capability of these machines as maybe giving you insight into how the brain actually works. But I don't think they work in any way like the actual brain, for reasons that I'll talk about. But yeah, basically what I think is going on with these creations like AlphaGo is that they have something more like an ersatz intelligence, that they're a very impressive imitation, but not the real thing. I actually think that there's more genuine intelligence in a worm than in GPT-3. So here's an interesting <laughs> example of a use of GPT-3, this language massive AI network, which is a language generator. So what it does is that you can train it on text that humans produced, and it kind of learns the stylistic patterns of the text. So what the, what's gone on here is that um, the human side of this project trained GPT-3 on the stylistic quirks of a particular poet. And after GPT-3 had been exposed to lots and lots of these poems, it was able to generate its own text 
in the style. So this is actually a poem created by GPT-3, and it's kind of poetic. And this is an image generated by another artificial neural network, which is kind of trained to do sketch-like work. What's really important about this project, though, is that the human side of the work, the work, the person that had actually instigated this project, had to edit what GPT-3 created. So it's not like GPT-3 by itself could just generate poems that sounded good. The human had to like, take snippets and lines and sort of put them together in a way that was more artful than that. So I think that's something that often gets forgotten when people talk about like, the capabilities of these machines. So anyway, I think the worm is more intelligent than this poetry creating machine. So in broad strokes, the reason for my thinking that current technologies are not a step along the way to AGI and that human-like intelligence will never be replicated in digital computing machines is that I think that there is a much deeper connection between intelligence and aliveness than AI proponents realize. This prompts us to ask, what is intelligence? Sorry, but now this is a question which is much too big an issue to be dealt with in just one slide. But anyway, let me just contrast some different ways to think about intelligence. So this first way that I've put up here just says that, well, something which could be a machine is intelligent just when it has some of the cognitive capacities that are distinctive of human beings or some other animals. And this is a way of thinking about intelligence that has really dominated the field of artificial intelligence. So when engineers like set up a benchmark saying that when a machine can play chess or when a machine can play Go, it is in some way intelligent, or when it can do facial, object recogni uh, facial recognition or object recognition, that's saying, well, when you can get the machine to do something clever that a personal animal can do, then it's on the way to being completely clever, or like an animal or a person. But this other way of thinking about what intelligence is, is saying that there's this pervasive property of living beings which you can't disconnect from our idea of intelligence. So on the second view, the point is that in order just to stay alive, an organism, even a bacterium, even a single-celled organism, needs sensitivity to its environment, behavioral adaptivity, some kind of ability to learn or to utilize past experience. And this is saying that plants, microbes, fungi with all their sig signaling, as well as animals, are in some sense intelligent. So at least at some base level, there is intelligence everywhere amongst living things. This suggests that li all living things have some form of intelligence, but not that only living things can be intelligent. So it's compatible with this view, it seems, that there could be artificial, non-biological versions of these capabilities. But here's why I think the pervasiveness of biological intelligence is relevant to the argument about AI. So the brain is an organ in a living body. The nervous system is made out of living cells. If these cells are already, like all cells, intelligent in some sense, let's call them protocognitive, this must be relevant to how it is that animals with brains and nervous systems have all the capacities that we classify as obviously intelligent. For example, a living cell is an inherently adaptive entity. Its learning is a fundamental component of the intelligence of humans and other animals. Learning is explained by neuroscientists in terms of brain plasticity the constant restructuring that occurs amongst brain cells at many scales throughout life. It must be that plant brain plasticity, and therefore learning, has the peculiar properties that it has because of the inherent adaptiveness of all living cells. It's interesting that artificial neural networks underlying current AI mimic in a very simplified form one kind of plasticity that goes on in the brain. But the process with which it's supposed to mimic learning, its training algorithm, is very unlike anything in the brain. This is probably because the neural network is running on computing hardware 
that has none of those proto-cognitive properties of living tissue. It gives us ersatz learning without the sensitivity and multi-scale adaptiveness of the original. But there's an argument that's often brought up here. When people like me who are skeptical about the prospects for AI make this observation that the only unquestionably intelligent things are living beings. So they'll say that, well, I'm in the situation now of someone at the turn of the previous century who looked around and saw that the only flying things were living things, they were birds and insects, and said, well, it's impossible for a machine to ever fly. And of course, they were proven wrong not soon after that. So the idea that people who are pro-AI come out with here is to say, well, there's no inherent connection between being able to fly and being alive, that there are some same laws of aerodynamics which go across whether you're a living thing or a machine. And they'll say, by the same turn, there are the same laws of cognition, the same laws of intelligence which hold whether you're a machine, an artificial thing, a non-living thing, or whether you're a biological creature. So they'll say, of course, you know, cognitive science can study intelligence, whether it's in a machine or in an animal. But I think the problem with this argument is that there's a big difference with what I'm claiming about the essential connection between life and intelligence, most living things can't actually fly. Flight is not essential to being alive, whereas my suspicion is that some form of intelligence, protocognition, really is necessary and essential for life. Which means that to properly understand intelligence, you, you need to root it in its biological context. And this is what makes me skeptical that you could have genuine intelligence and not fake artificial intelligence in anything other than a living system. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.